Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, uh, to all of the audience uh, that have dialed in to, to today. Uh, it's, it's the first collaborative digital seminar between Global Sports and Johann Cruyff Institute, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, moderate this session called The Impact of the Digital Age on the Marketing of Football. Um, first of all, we have a fantastic audience. We have got 1,300 people from, nine, well, from over nine um, countries that, that we've measured, but there's 35% of that audience that are from outside of those nine countries. So we have a truly international audience, and I hope that we can pr provide you with some truly international insights into digital marketing and football. Um, please do ensure that you uh, get involved. There are, as Christine mentioned, there is uh, an opportunity to ask questions, and please do so. There is also uh, a hashtag GSJ webinar uh, that's on social, and that will be active during the session, and please uh, be involved or get involved with that as well. That's hashtag GSJ webinar. Okay, so to start, we've got 45 minutes, um, so I want to, want to kick off and get, get going. I've done a little bit of background into uh, the digital age of marketing in football, uh, and recently uncovered what I thought was some very interesting uh, stats or some figures that I hope will whet your appetite. Um, Instagram seems to be the choice for teams to follow sport. 30% of the top 100 accounts on Instagram are related to sport. One of the biggest is Ronaldo, who has 79 million followers on Instagram, accumulating 2.5 million new followers each month, which is about 87,000 new followers a day on average, which is, we, can, we can all imagine will be a very attractive proposition for most brands or any brand that wants to get involved uh, in football. The other element that I wanted to share with you was that EA Sports uh, is also driving the interaction amongst fans uh, through gaming and digital. Um, the El Clasico match generated 117 million plays to reenact the match the following day. 117 million plays. In the off season, 2 million players per day play FIFA 17 Ultimate Team. So we can start to see the sheer size that digital is reaching um, in, in this modern day. Um, and without much further ado, I want to introduce our panelists who are much better positioned than I to, to give you a first-hand insight into what they are doing in digital and what the future holds in digital. Um, right, so I would first like to introduce my first panelist. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce Steve Adams. Uh, Steve is the Senior Commercial Acquisitions Manager at the FA. Uh, Steve has also used to work at Facebook, uh, advising digital media strategy and spend with clients globally. Uh, and he is going to tell us a little bit more about the FA and their digital strategy and proposition and what he feels the future will hold. Um, during that time. I then followed by Richard Lamb. Richard is currently in New York, where it is uh, just gone four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so thank you very much, Richard, for joining us. Richard is an international business director for Inter Milan, um, which uh, is obviously a, a huge job, a huge opportunity. Uh, Inter being certainly the, one of the top ten uh, biggest football clubs uh, globally, uh, and Richard's experience extends for having, from having 12 years sales and business development in Asia, and he can speak fluent Mandarin, so I'll be very interested to hear from a Chinese perspective where, where digital is going. And the third... Uh, our 
third panelist today is Richard Denton, uh, who uh, some of you may know from the Johan Cruyff Institute, but, you know, uh, but Richard has been involved with uh, the agency world advising brands on their digital strategies and digital implementation across many, many different sporting entities, including football. Um, so welcome through all three of you to this panel. Um, I'm going to hand over to Steve, uh, where Steve will be able to share with you some of the insights and knowledge uh, of what is going on in, uh, at the FA. Steve. Thank you, Will, uh, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for everyone for joining in today. Um, it's great to be here on behalf of the FA this morning and introduce a bit more about the work we're doing uh, and the progress we're, we're making across digital channels. Um, as for everyone, digital is crucial to the story we're telling uh, and to the audiences that we're trying to connect to. Um, to start with, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background into the job we have here at the FA. Um, we're an organization that's 153 years old, uh, the original uh, governing body of football. So we're kind of uniquely placed um, throughout the history of the game to kind of make steps to connect with audiences at different times. And it's been an interesting point at which to see audiences grow around different assets that we have. Um, the visual you can all see on screen now kind of represents our main assets and properties that we look after. Uh, and you'll be familiar with most of these. So our more um, prominent asset such as the England national team, the Emirates FA Cup, and of course the iconic Wembley Stadium, which is where I'm broadcasting to you from now. Um, these obviously are all great touch points for us with audiences around the world, and we have big digital followings around each of them. Um, but also our remit is extremely wide as the governing body of football in England. Uh, around 10 million people play football in this country every year. Every year. That's from small-sided amateur games through to Sunday league football and every area of participation that you can imagine. So our big digital challenge is around the national game and how we can engage with that audience of 10 million people from all walks of life and have a conversation with them about the right things at the right time. So in terms of our job and our, and our aim, it's ambitious and we've got a lot to do over the next few years and digital is really going to be at the heart of what we do. My role itself is within the commercial acquisitions team, so I'm responsible, responsible for bringing on new brand partners to the FA. And on the screen now, you can just see a few images of some of the work that the team has done over the last few years. Um, the FA Cup is a competition that's steeped in history, but one that we're keen to remain at the forefront of football and may, maintain its position in being modern and relevant. Um, for example, we ran a campaign on Facebook last season uh, to win, a, win two tickets and a VIP experience uh, to come along to the Emirates FA Cup final. And we had about 5,000 entries from all around the world, a lot from the US, uh, a lot from Southeast Asia, and it was actually um, a couple of fans from Thailand that won and got to visit when we the experience. So just one example about how we're using digital to engage with global audiences around a UK competition. Um, England as well is, is a very big digital property for us and drives a lot of content views and engagement across all platforms. Um, one good example of how this really blew up around a big event was when, when Wayne Rooney broke the international goals record for England when he scored his 50th against Switzerland in uh, September of last year. Um, this content around, around the around the goal and we created content about Wayne walking into the dressing room after the match uh, generated over 48 million views of content over a two-day period uh, which was massive and huge credit to both FA TV who create the content and our digital comms team who pushed that out at the right moment when people were looking to engage and we got a huge spike of engagement around that moment. And there are also kind of more localised initiatives such as the Little FA Skills Programme, which encourages parents to get their kids involved in football, uh, which children age 5 to 11. So driving online sign-ups and participation through that is really key to us as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have, and I mentioned this earlier, is that we have an audience of about 25 million people through our digital channels. Um, about half of that's through social and half of that is through other touch points. 
Um, we have a lot of different people to speak to about different things, and our biggest challenge is speaking to them in the right way. On screen, you can just see a, a small selection of some of the different web uh, properties that we have, and these do different roles from enabling people to buy tickets to events here at Wembley, to checking the results of their Sunday league team at the weekends, or to buying an England shirt if you're overseas. So there's a lot of different things that we can do, and it's about making sure that's consistent and everyone has a great experience when they come to speak to us online. I think the biggest aim for us, though, is having the conversation and enabling us to do this in a seamless way. So a big project that we're embarking on now over the next 18 to 24 months will be to digitize uh, football within England. And by that, I mean every touch point you can imagine. So if you turn up at the weekend to pay your subs to your captain to play your match on the weekend, that should be able to be done through an app, for example. You should be able to go on and enroll your, car, your child to a local course via your phone or via a web platform. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes at the FA to bring everything that we do together and facilitate it through digital channels. Um, so that's a very quick overview of the sort of work we're doing. I look, and I look forward to uh, your questions as we go through this morning. Thank you, Steve. Um, if, if Richard... Uh, Lam could could go next. Um, that would be wonderful. Thanks very much. And um, just to reiterate uh, Stephen's words there. So uh, welcome to everyone, and, and thank you, especially those that are calling either very late at night or very early in the morning. So it's uh, it's great to have this opportunity to speak with you today. So uh, um, so my name is Richard Lam, and I work at uh, Inter Milan as international business director. Um, a little bit of a background to the club. Inter was established uh, oh, just over 108 years ago. Um, some of you may not be aware that um, 108 years ago there was only one club in Milan, um, uh, which, is, which is now known as AC Milan, and there was a, a disagreement on the board where half of the board wanted to uh, to be inclusive and, and to allow players from all over the world to play for the club and the other half of the board wanted to keep it solely Italian. Um, and the half of the board that, that wanted to make it inclusive and make it international formed what, what today we know as FC Internationale. So the, our mantra uh, from 108 years ago, but, but really is, is relevant today, is we are brothers of the world um, because we, we are inclusive. We're a club that embraces internationalization on the pitch. Our players are from all over the world. Even 108 years ago, we were very international. And today on our digital platforms as well, we make sure that we're able to communicate with our fans from around the world, not only in different languages, but with creating with different content and, uh, and, and in a way that really resonates and, and the fans can experience us in ways that are more relevant to their background and to their culture. So. Um, if we just go on to the uh, our digital position, um, we were so as as uh, as, as uh, Stephen just said there, we are um, at Inter again also on on a lot of different platforms. Um, I think this is quite common in a lot of clubs now, be it big or small, um, Facebook, Twitter, etc. We have uh, several years ago also localized with some um, some content more relevant. To, to certain countries around the world. So, for example, in China, we have Weibo and WeChat, and I think this is very standard now at a lot of clubs um, around the world. We, what we're doing going forward is we've just, about a year ago, we embarked on a new digital strategy, um, and, and that is now coming to fruition. So, as of next month, we will be going live with a new website, um, and then on our social media platforms as well, we'll be renewing, especially the content on some of those platforms. So what we're looking to do is to create a more localized message um, around the world. So for example, at the moment, historically, what we've been doing is, is it's been a very much a one directional um, communication. The club has been creating content not for the fan to engage with, but just for the fan to read. And so this is all now going to be changing uh, as, we, as we go live on our new digital strategy. What we're really trying to achieve, and I think this is vital on digital platforms for modern clubs, is to really to start communicating with the fans in, in a two-way direction. So 
you know, ways that you can do that, obviously you need to be on many different platforms. Millennials, for example, really tend to communicate on, on social media platforms. But then we still do have older fans as well where, where we need to have a website presence. And the key to it is, is understanding what those channels are. And, and we spent the last year working very hard on that. So as I mentioned in China, for example, you know, WeChat and Weibo are very strong. Um, but that may not be the case in other parts of Southeast Asia. So for example, Line, which is, I believe, Korean and Japanese, they're very popular in Korea and Japan, but they're also very popular in Thailand and Southeast Asia, but, but less so in other parts of the world. And, and obviously in South America and North America, um, people tend to use, you know, very, you know, Facebook is obviously very popular, but there are also some local um, popular channels as well. We, we need to understand that we've been working hard to understand what people use and how they communicate. The next piece is obviously the content that you have. And like I mentioned, traditionally, since, since we launched the website sort of 10, 12 years ago, the content tends to be in one direction where it's just, these are the players training, this is the injuries, um, this is the, the coach, what he wants to achieve on the, on the game, etc. Now what we're looking to do is to create content that is, that resonates with fans and appreciates that fans, although they're fans of Inter, that's what brings them together, but they have very many different ways of experiencing the club and engaging with the club, and we need to appreciate that. And that's not only through the language that we use, so be it in Chinese or be it in Spanish or Italian, English, etc., but also the content changes as well. So, you know, in Japan we have Nagatomo as, as one of our as one of our top players. So in Japan, what we need to be doing is talking more about him as. Um, on the pitch, but also there's a lot of interest about what the players do off the pitch. So we're going to be start creating a lot more stories about the players, about their family life, about you know what, how they are, how did they become successful. Um, we have a CSR arm called Intercampus, which is in 29 countries in the world, the only club to be fully recognised by the United Nations. And one of our players actually came through the Intercampus system in Colombia. So you know we're going to start telling these stories and, and hopefully not only engage our fans, but also then to engage fans of football. So just so you're aware, and I think this is relevant to the digital platform, if we look at fans in Asia, for example, the, the majority of football fans like, I think it's 2.8 clubs if you take an average. So what that means is, is the traditional fan in Europe who, you know, like myself, really just follow one club, and I'm sure that there's many people on this call that also are the same. But what we're finding in Asia particularly is that people – don't just like one club. They tend to follow, uh, you know, 2.8 clubs or let's say call it two or three clubs in different leagues. And so we need to not only attract the diehard fans of Inter, but the fans of football who want to learn more about the club. And so we need, you know, what we're going to be doing is is making our content more relevant and, and resonate with, with our diehard fans, but also the fans that are just interested in football. And I think this is key for, for football clubs as they go forward. So hopefully that gives you an indication of what we're doing digitally. And I think content is, is a very, very important driver of that. And taking it to the next level is, is hyper-localized content. Um, but I'll pass over to, to Mr. Richard Denton. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and over to Richard Denton now, who will talk a bit more uh, around the brand perspective. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the uh, Johan Kauf uh, Institute uh, today. Uh, I've chosen to uh, present uh, two small cases uh, to get the ball rolling before we go into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, the first one of those uh, is uh, very familiar to uh, a lot of football fans around the world. A couple of years ago, Heineken uh, launched a campaign that attracted a lot of attention and got people uh, talking. Why did it work so well and what was the role of digital? Well, firstly, they had uh, some very clear marketing objectives to maximize the impact of the Champions League sponsorship, obviously, to drive brand awareness and engagement and ultimately to try and improve sales. Secondly, and what I really like about this particular campaign was a key insight that approximately three quarters of the people watching Champions League were watching it alone and at home. And most of them were multi-screening using tablets and smartphones while watching the games. So Heineken decided to develop a campaign which as you can see was known as Share the Sofa. And as part of that campaign, they created hundreds of pieces of content that were broadcast out via Twitter live as the football matches were being played. These video clips were made by football celebrities that shared their opinions and insights on the match in a light-hearted and highly visual way 
from their own sofa. So adding entertainment, if you like, to the football experience as well, with singing bartenders, cheerleaders, and musical guests. Simply speaking, they were entertaining the fans with Heineken as a backdrop. The second screen interactive technology was a key to the success as this turned a one-way viewing experience into a multi-dimensional interactive uh, experience. If you look at what it actually uh, delivered, the results speak for themselves. This campaign generated enormous 1.2 billion content views or media impressions, and according to the research, gave Heineken about a 79% share of all conversations in relationship to Champions League sponsorship online. According to the publicized research, it also led to a 7% increase in purchase intent with this particular target audience. And the campaign was activated in more than 90 markets, reflecting the real power of a platform like the Champions League. Some of the key learnings, as you can see, it, what makes it such a good campaign is that it takes a clear audience insight into multi-screening and uses this to develop a core creative concept. This was identified as an opportunity to facilitate something the fans enjoy, social interaction around a sport, team, and competition that they're passionate about. In a subtler way, Heineken were able to position the brand in the conversation. The use of real-time filming and interaction is authentic, and it appeals to the fans. Sometimes brands adopt a more scripted approach, which is less appealing and, and subsequently ignored by the fans. There's perhaps more risk, but also more reward in, in the way the fans respond to the Heineken brand by taking this approach. The campaign was picked up by numerous media outlets and uh, discussed globally, adding to both its reach and impact. And finally, the campaign used some innovative techniques to achieve live video streaming, because it was created before Periscope, um, a Twitter app, app to create live video streams was created. Because of Periscope and other social live video streaming, such as Facebook Live, these kinds of campaigns are easier to create and deliver from a technical point of view today. So that's the first case I just wanted to share with you. Moving on now to something which is a little bit more recent and also probably very familiar, as many of you follow the team during the uh, recent Euro 2016 Championships, take a quick look at some brands that are more intrinsically involved in the game. So, uh, like uh, UEFA Champions League, Euro 2016 uh, affords brands the opportunity to engage with millions of fans. And in previous years, the marketing impact has often been centered around the value of being an official sponsor, or maybe the number of participating teams wearing particular branded uh, apparel, or the star players themselves promoting it. And as the statisticians amongst you will know, Adidas provided the team kit for about nine countries uh, in the last uh, tournament versus six from Nike and five from Puma, and the remainder supplied by four other suppliers. And of course, they use different ambassadors, such as Adidas and Pogba and Bale and Ozil, and Nike with Ronaldo, Runo and Ibrahimovic. But from a brand presence, this is really worthless if there's no activation. And this is what these figures show here uh, from the pre-tournament research provided by Repicom, now known as uh, Nielsen Sport, and it's quite revealing in terms of uh, pure numbers. The graphic for Nike on the left shows greater numbers of followers, and in this case on Facebook, more than Adidas. But this did somehow not translate into greater engagement pre-tournament. In reality, these figures probably changed quite significantly during the final build-up to Euro 2016 and during the tournament itself, particularly when new content can be created and activated in less than under 48 hours. According to some of the post-Euro uh, 2016 uh, feedback and, and statements, Adidas was expecting to achieve record sales of about 2.5 billion in apparel, slightly ahead of projections uh, for Nike. And from a digital perspective, we can see some parallels between a Heineken Share the Sofa campaign. First of all, there's an overarching theme for the campaign, First Never Follows, to embr embrace the launch of uh, uh, products like Ace and X and Messy Boots, as well as the Mercury Pack Adidas. The focus on personalities and skills of the Adidas endorsed players is reflected in the design look and feel as well. The video heavy content from Adidas appears to have worked well with the fans, sharing the content produced by Adidas for the whole of Euro 2016 across a variety of social media channels. And despite not having a team in the final of Euro 2016, this Adidas campaign delivers high visibility and engagement across the whole of the tournament. Sometimes being the official sponsor helps to acquire original and authentic content, which resonates with this coveted uh, fan group. In conclusion, it's not what you have in terms of teams and players and content, but how you make it accessible 
relevant and engaging to enhance the fan experience. And with that short introduction, I'd like to pass it back over to Will, who will now conduct the Q&A session. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Both Richard and Steve, very uh, interesting introductions to uh, the digital world that, that you all live in. Uh, and it seems to me that the digital market is, is very focused or, or very much driven around, around fan engagement. And, and that's sort of something that I want to touch upon first of all. Um, and, and it seems that the, the, the FA as, um, as the organization that's representing football across England, that the fan engagement is much wider remit than just a club or a team. Um, whereas Inter Milan obviously is a club and therefore you're, you are looking to grow your fan base um, just for, 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 one, for one entity. So my first question really to Steve is, as a, you're looking for a broader remit of, of, of engagement, you talked about earlier, you talked about the global um, importance or the global reach that you, you have in terms of the uh, successful winners coming from Thailand. What objectives are you trying to tackle through digital uh, at the Football Association? Yeah, they're, they're quite uh, diverse, actually. So if you think about England to start with, um, we have a big stadium here in Wembley that we need to fill. So a lot of the messaging is around ticket sales. But of course, the content can't all be driven just with purchasing messages. Um, we have to create content that engages and makes people feel passionate about what we're trying to do. Um, likewise, the Emirates FA Cup, uh, whilst we're all also trying to support the teams that are taking part, we're having to handle audiences who are fans of all of the, all of the different clubs that are participating, um, as well as international audiences who are just interested in English football. Um, so the digital comms team here have got a very um, interesting but sometimes tricky job just to balance those messages out and make sure that people are getting enough relevant content at the right times. Um, and they, they do a really good job, and I think it's all about analytics, informing those content decisions. So, you know, what's working best? Is it video views? Is it competitions? What's really driving the engagement that we want? And I think we've seen a shift over the last 18 months in terms of the sorts of content we're now pushing is a lot more visual, a lot more engaging, um, a lot more kind of magazine-led in terms of the greatest goals from the cup or the greatest England moments seem to be really resonating. Okay, and, and your audience presumably is, is the English audience in the UK or English, there's an audience of, of English people abroad or you know, what's, the, what's the interest in the global audience for the FA when your remit is to grow football locally? Yeah, I mean, our properties in terms of England and the Emirates FA Cup are absolutely global. I mean, England audiences typically are watched by a television audience of 40 to 50 million people around the world. Uh, the FA Cup final in, in May of this year was viewed in 182 countries. So, yes, they are properties based in England, but the, you know, the world tunes in to watch uh, and get involved. So that's the balance we have to strike uh, in terms of pr preserving the heritage and uniqueness of those properties, but also making them accessible to audiences in different countries who want to learn more, want to find out more, uh, and want to get involved with doing yeah, so, um, Richard Lamb, if I could bring you in at this point in terms of, of Inter Milan, you talk about a two-way communication that historically has been a bit more one direction led, yet you've got 311 million fans that you communicate with in, in many different countries, in many different languages. Um, how, what, what are the objectives that you are trying to tackle through digital and how realistic is it to be able to um, in, you know, have a two-way conversation with 311 million people globally? I, I, yeah, that's a very good question. I think firstly, um, the, 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 the industry has changed significantly when it comes to calculating the, the fans and followers, et cetera. So you know, five years ago, roughly, maybe more, the, the onus was on quantity. How many fans and followers do you have? How many Facebook likes do you have? And, and that was what was really driving the conversation. That, that's changed significantly uh, in recent years where now a lot of questions are, uh, and the onus is on, what's the engagement? We don't, we're not worried whether you have X amount of millions, et cetera, but how do you engage with those fans? 
Um, how many retweets do you have? How many comments do you get left on Facebook? How do the fans engage with you on these platforms? And so that's changed significantly. So I think, you know, historically there's been a huge disconnect between, and this is probably true of a lot of top clubs, you know, we have X amount of million fans. Now the questions are, well, that's great, but how do you communicate with them? Um, and so what we, I mean, there's no easy solution to that. I mean, what the next, the obvious step is, well, we've got you know, 311 million fans and followers around the world. The first question is not how do we communicate them. The first question is who are they? Um, you know, are they are they predominantly diehard fans? I mean, the answer at that quantity is no. A lot of them, like I mentioned earlier, are. It's a mix of fans. It's a mix of people who are interested in Inter, but also like other clubs. And then it's people who are just interested in Inter, not as a football club, but as a brand, because they associate with Milan and Italian culture and and some of the brand messages that that um, and the brand personality of Inter. So we need to understand the differences of, of of why people follow and like Inter, and then we can start to communicate with them. And and there's no simple solution, but it's about finding different touch points that work. So if we create a story around a particular player, how many retweets does it get? How many people can engage with that? How many people are sharing that? How many key opinion leaders are talking about it on their own blogs or you know on their own YouTube pages, etc. And so once we get a much better understanding of how people are engaging with us and what works, um, then we can start to do more of that. And at the moment, it's still very much at the early stages where we're just trying to understand who those followers are and 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 why they and why they like Inter and and, and what really what what is a, what it is about the club that that they enjoy. Thank you. So we're and, still and, very early stages. And, and do you distinguish that audience by age or by? Um, by location or, or by, by something else, or, or how, how, how have you started to distinguish that? Or, uh, distinguish well, I, that think, I, I think in reality, how we're, we're still very much going through the process. Um, and so, you know, we've got Repucom, Kantar, and, and, uh, and, and our other digital partners um, helping us dissect you know, who our followers are, et cetera. But I think what's really important is listening to our partners and the, the the commercial companies out there because they understand much better than football clubs how people are engaging with brands because it, it's important to them to sell products. And, and what's been interesting listening to them is how they're starting to engage with millennials where you know, pre-millennial it was really digital platforms were important as a tool but now, you know, millennials, it's not, you know, digital platforms, they're not at all anymore. It's, it's an intricate part of their life. And so yeah. it's really, it's really uh, interesting about how top companies and brands are trying to sort of key into this, this huge change within the way that people are using, you know, the millennials especially are using these digital platforms and how they key into that. And I think football clubs, because they're very big brands, people assume that they're big companies, but they're not. They're, they're very small. And... You know, to, to be perfectly frank, they're not particularly, apart from a couple of exceptions, they're not particularly savvy in these areas. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from from these large companies and brands and FMCG, et cetera, who are investing heavily in, into creating some fantastic digital platforms and, and, and the content, et cetera, and learn from that and, and make sure we're also aligned strategically with that. Fantastic. Uh, and that sort of takes me nicely on to, to Richard Denton. Uh, fr from an agency perspective or from a brand perspective, Richard, you, you kindly shared with us some fascinating insights into the Heineken sponsorship. Um, what I'm interested to know about brands and their use of digital is, is, is digital uh, replacing the traditional channels or, or is, is uh, digital in addition to the traditional channels Therefore, is the spend bigger or is the spend the same? And it's just a, a, a matter of carving up the different uh, methodologies or different strategies to reach the different audiences. Yeah, no, that's a, a very uh, relevant uh, point, Will. Um, I, I would think that most brands at the moment uh, would tell you that um, digital is uh, in addition to uh, the existing spend that they have, and uh, in particular, in addition to a lot of the uh, sponsorship rights that they uh, acquire or buy from organizations like uh, the FA and, 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 and the football clubs. Um, and I think the, the biggest uh, addition that digital brings uh, for these brands is that it allows them to have that uh, two-way dialogue um, with uh, the, the football fans. 
I think it was mentioned a little bit earlier that there was uh, more of communication in the past about trying to send out information to communicate with those fans, and now they're able to communicate with them in real time, uh, as uh, explained in, in the first uh, uh, case study. Uh, in general, of course, digital spend has been uh, increasing rapidly, and, and in certain markets now, from some of the research I've seen, it appears that more brands are putting a greater budget in, into digital, whether that means they're reducing uh, the other more traditional uh, media spend, um, that varies enormously from industry to industry and, and sector uh, to sector. Um, but yeah, I could imagine uh, a time in the not too distant future uh, where the emphasis is very much uh, uh, on digital, uh, particularly for engagement with the uh, millennials, as was just mentioned by uh, one of my colleagues uh, here. And I think that that's um, really where the, the brands can add to, say, enhancing the fan experience. So they're building on what's already uh, available, um, particularly with those so-called uh, money can't buy experiences, which bring the fans into a part of the game, the football game, uh, whether that's a pre-match experience or whether that's, you know, during the match itself. Uh, we've seen brands, you know, even uh, giving uh, uh, fans the opportunity to, you know, literally sit in the dugout and uh, sit next to the, the manager, the coach, and, and the players on the bench and experience a, a football match uh, from a completely different uh, perspective. And I think that's something which we will you know, tend to see more of in, in, in the future. And particularly uh, as virtual reality starts to take hold, uh, the ability to bring more fans uh, into the experience who can't see it physically in a stadium which maybe only has 50,000 uh, seats uh, available. And I think that there's a number of brands out there that are already exploring that um, with uh, you know, quite a lot of success. Okay, fantastic. And I'll come back to, to Steve in terms of the Football Association. Digital, uh, you know, digitalizing football in England is, is no small task. Um, how have the budgets changed um, from traditional spend to digital spend? Is it the same budget and, and just uh, reorganized, or, or is the digital budget a separate budget that's getting bigger and, and traditional is, is, is becoming less? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say investment in digital is increasing across the board. I mean, it's the most efficient channel to get messages out quickly uh, and efficiently to be you know, targeted in the right way. Um, everything we're doing now starts with is a digital standpoint in terms of from a new sponsor acquisition point of view what can a brand come on board and own specifically um, but then audiences and how we apply a lot of the good work that we're doing so a lot of the work that the FA does um, you won't hear about it unless it's targeted to you it could be providing dis disabled football facilities local communities it could be enabling people to sign up to coaching courses more easily um, it could be enabling teams just to get together and find new people to play with when people want to play football. So we're putting a lot more focus in this and giving people the tools and, cha and channels so that they can then make these connections and, and access the game. That's what we're basically here to do. So yes, marketing, I would say, over the last few years definitely has pivoted even more towards digital. Um, yeah. And it's definitely the lead kind of channel for us moving forward. Okay. Um, and, and, and Richard Lamb, from, from an inter perspective, have you seen the budgets increase or just rejigged? Um, for us specifically, um, that there's been a significant amount of change at the club. Um, obviously, three years ago, Mr. Eric Tahir purchased the club from Mr. Moratti, and, and then three months ago, um, Suning took a majority stake in the club. So, because of those changes, um, you know, we're, we're focused at the moment on, on sort of uh, building out the team and, um, you know, we've seen some, some great new signings. It's not yet trickled down to some of those departments, but digital is, is hugely important for us. So, you know, what, what I understand is there will be increasing budgets, in, uh, especially in digital marketing. Okay, fantastic. And Richard Denton, from, from a brand perspective, we, we've, we've explored sort of what has been happening and what possibly what is happening. In terms of going forward, uh, obviously the engagement of, of the audience and the association of that audience with the brand is, is key to the success of that investment. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently around esports um, and the growth of esports. What's the, what are brands' attitudes towards 
spending their money on something like esports versus um, a club, a team, a federation, or a rights holder? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> uh, that's that's an area where uh, a lot of brands are just uh, scratching the surface. Um, for those involved in esports, of course. Um, uh, most of the, the brands currently associated are what we call the, the endemic brands. So those are the, um, the products and the services which are very much intrinsic to the delivery um, of, of esports, particularly to the, to the gamers and the people who uh, participate and the, uh, if you like, the infrastructure uh, that is required in order to stream the content out via platforms like, uh, like Twitch. Um, and I think, yeah, a, a lot of uh, brands that don't necessarily have a role at the moment in that space we're asking themselves you know what is it that we can bring to the to the experience for the fan which will make it more enjoyable and also position our, our brand in a way that it's not seen as interrupting that experience and I think in that respect that's probably a parallel to uh, most uh, sponsorship activation is how does a brand get involved in it in a way that it's appreciated and that it offers something which is really <clears throat> uh, creates a synergy uh, between the brand uh, and, and the particular sport or the experience that they're trying uh, to offer. Um, and I think one or two football clubs have started to embrace this already by uh, either sponsoring or uh, acquiring, if you like, if you like um, some of these gamer uh, teams or, or individuals, uh, some of the, uh, the, the so-called YouTubers. Um, one of them very famously speaking last week at a conference in London called uh, Spencer Owen, who's uh, set up his own uh, channel, Spencer FC. Uh, and he's being approached by uh, different brands as well because his particular style of, of language, the way in which he communicates with his audience, um, the, the interaction with, um, with the football players themselves, like uh, Gareth Bale, for example, uh, comes across in a way in which his particular audience uh, appreciates uh, what he's doing. Um, and it really does um, appeal to that, uh, that age group because he's acting and behaving in a way that is normal to them. We might look at it and think, well, that's not exactly the way we want to position our brand. Uh, but when you think about it, uh, every every fan, every individual, whatever your age or, or interests are, you like to be communicated in, in a way which is just familiar to your your style of life. Um, so I think once uh, some of the, the retail brands work that out, they'll be able to bring some activations into the esports arena, which will then uh, uh, open that up and, and again enhance the experience for the, uh, the esports fans. Thank you, and, and, and Richard Lamb, from, from a club perspective, uh, some people see it as a, uh, as a, uh, a threat or a challenge, other, other people are embracing it, and I think certainly in the German club system, there seems to be uh, a big appetite for, for, for eSports. What, what does, what does Inter see, the, you know, what's, uh, how does Inter see the future from an eSports perspective, but also from a future digital perspective? Um, we, we, we've not done a lot in esports at the moment, to be honest with you. We, we, we focus on other areas, but I think there's a, a fantastic amount of opportunity there, and it's cer certainly something that we'd be looking at going forward. I think the, um, the the real key from it is the challenge always is, you know, when you work for a, for a football club, you can't just pick up the stadium and move it thousands of kilometres to where, say, one of your largest fan bases is. You need to find ways to, to always excite and, and engage with the fans, and I think esports is is the, one of the one of the most modern, closest ways that fans can get to actually, you know, getting the experience of playing on the pitch and being close to the club and a part of the club. So, you know, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's things that Inter, especially, but other top clubs will be embracing. Okay, fantastic. And, and Steve, from from an FA perspective. Um, where do you, what, what sort of uh, one thing do you feel will change the face of uh, of how the FA operate from a digital perspective in the future? Hmm. Um, good question. I, I think there's a few ways I can answer that. One is once we have our ambition in place in terms of this platform to communicate with everyone that plays football in England, that's going to be central to us in terms of monetizing as well. Once we know who these people are, we can then start having conversations with them in the right way. For example, we should then know if a parent has signed their child up for a skills course, bought a ticket to an event here at Wembley, bought an England shirt through englandstore.com, and we 
we can start to join the dots between these consumers who are currently engaging with us in different ways and, and kind of bring that together. Um, in terms of the future, uh, I guess it's just about adapting really because as new technology comes along, I mean, all of a sudden now we have Periscope, Facebook Live, you know, technically everyone via their phone in their pocket can be a broadcaster. So how do we make sure that that's not a threat and we actually harness that in the right way to deliver interesting and exciting content because the biggest risk is standing still um, and not following where the audience and interest is going. Uh, and we want to be at the forefront of that, um, but not just using things for the sake of it. Um, so I think adapting, not necessarily doing things first, but doing things best, um, and just making sure we're using the right channels to speak to the right audiences. Okay, fantastic. Um, we're, we're, we're running out of time. I have taken some of the questions uh, from, that we've had from the audience. Uh, there, there's been questions from, from Colombia, from Greece, um, from Spain, uh, and from the UK and Netherlands. So thank you all very much for those questions. I have tried to include those questions, as I said, as part of uh, the questions that I have been asking the audience. I think what is, is very clear um, is that there's still a strong desire that, to know your audience through the digital, um, through the digital, to, uh, digital channels. Um, there is a, a big desire to, to better engage with that audience once you know who that audience is. That's a very strong uh, message from, from both Inter and from the FA uh, and also from the brands. It's also about understanding how to harness those channels and how to make best use of those channels. Um, before we conclude, I think there is one last question I'd like to ask each of you. Um, and that is really to help our audience better understand what you believe are the attributes uh, to success in the digital world. For somebody that is looking to, uh, to move into both football and, and to digital, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think the attributes are that will make them successful? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Richard Denton to, to kick that off. Just maybe one or two key things that people will need to um, be aware of if they want to be successful in this space? Well, I, I, I think it's still um, uh, absolutely essential that any brand uh, going into um, this, this arena has um, an overarching uh, uh, brand strategy and, and don't just look uh, at uh, digital as, uh, as, as standalone um, and to understand the, the distinction between uh, content and, and communicating uh, with fans uh, to make sure that uh, you know that the right fan uh, content is available to, to the right type of fans uh, at, at the right time. So whether that's pre-match or you know during the match or, or, or post-match, uh, and to avoid the uh, the pitfalls of the uh, the one-size-fits-all uh, syndrome. I think that's probably uh, two or three items which uh, a lot of people sometimes skate over and uh, afterwards only realise that they haven't really delivered the, that hyper focused or hyper-targeted uh, content that, that the fans are really looking for. Thank you. Um, and, and, and Richard Lamb? Yeah, I agree with that um, completely. I think content is the most important thing. I think that um, it's got it's to be used to enhance the fan experience, but also uh, the content has got to be, before you create that content, you've got to understand who your fans are and, and, and how they engage with the club and, and what they want to see. Thank you, Richard. And, and Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, building on what the, the two Richards have just said, which I completely agree with as well, it's about um, under, taking a step back sometimes and understanding how platforms are being used. Um, you don't want to be the, the uncool parent at the party in terms of how you're using these channels. And that's something you've got to be very conscious of. These aren't broadcast platforms, they're engagement platforms. So be prepared for a conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. I think, you know, we, we've, we've run out of time. Um, we could go on for another three days uh, on this topic. I've got 101 other questions that, that I'd like to ask, I'd like to explore, but unfortunately, we don't have time um, any longer. I would like to thank all the panellists, Steve, Richard and Richard for your contribution. Um, I'd also like to thank Johan Kreuz uh, Institute and Global Sports Jobs for making this happen. I hope it's the first of many rather than, rather than the last. I think it's been very, very insightful, hopefully very useful. 
And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for your input and your attention. Uh, and hopefully you'll join us again in the future when, uh, when we have the next one. Thank you all very much uh, and, and good luck. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, bye.